Okay. Renato, por favor, coloca o seu YouTube no mudo. Yeah. <laughs> 
and out. Renato, pode começar. Renato, desculpa. É... Boa noite. Good night. I'm going to speak in English. Uh, uh, I wish uh, a good evening to everyone, to all associates from the Brazilian uh, Soil Mechanics Society. It's a special night to every one of us. I am currently the editor of the Soils and Rocks Journal. And I will introduce you to our special commemorative presentation today from Professor Harry Polos. It's an honor, it's a sincere honor to introduce you to Professor Harry Polos, who is an internationally recognized professional from the foundation engineering area. Moreover, he's a good friend of mine and a close collaborator to our universities in Brazil, particularly to our university in Brasilia for more or for the last 20 years or so. Professor Polos <coughs> has also always supported our society, having visited Brazil several times and presented uh, at least two state-of-art speeches in our past national conferences. So let me briefly uh, go through his uh, curriculum vitae, which I'm going to read through my uh, slide here. Uh, Harry Polos joined the Department of Civil Engineering at Un Sydney University in 1965 and was appointed a professor in 1982, a position he held until his retirement in 2001. In 1989, he joined Coffee Partners International and is currently a senior consultant with Coffee. He's also an emeritus professor at the University of <coughs> Sydney and an adjunct professor at Hong Kong University of Science and Technology. He has been involved in a large number of high rise and infrastructure projects in Australia and overseas, including the Burj Khalifa and the Dubai Creek Tower in Dubai and the 720 kilometers Ignacia Odus motorway in Greece. He was selected as the Australian Civil Engineer of the Year for 2003 by the Institution of Engineers Australia. And in 2010 was elected a distinguished member of the American Society of Civil Engineers, ASCE. In 2014, he was indu inducted <coughs> into the US National Academy of Engineering in 2017, he was awarded the Outstanding Leaders and Projects Opal Award for Lifetime Achievement in Design by ASCE. So without any further <laughs> delay, uh, I will pass the stage to Professor Harry Polos, thanking him in advance for his kind acceptance of this special, very special talk in our celebration date. Uh, those who want to ask questions during the presentation, just write down the questions sent to our organizing uh, uh, committee. And uh, I will, in the end, read the questions to Professor Harry Poles. The questions can be sent in, either in Portuguese or in English. I will translate <coughs> to him in English. Uh, thank you very much. Please, Professor Polos, you can continue from now on. Thank you very much again. Um, I hope you can all see my screen. Boa noite, and thank you very much, Professor Cunha, for uh, your introduction. 
And thank you to the Brazilian Society uh, for inviting me to give uh, this lecture. Uh, and thank you to the audience uh, for listening in. Uh, it's a great pleasure to re-contact with my Brazilian colleagues and friends uh, after 10 years uh, that I was last in Brazil. I want to talk uh, this evening about a favorite subject of mine, which is deep foundation design. And I want to uh, share my experience and views uh, on uh, the uh, design issues, the procedures that we use for design, and some of the inadequacies that I perceive in common design practice. <clears throat> and in doing this, I don't want to suggest that all design practice is inadequate, uh, or that I will cover every aspect of design that uh, perhaps may need um, improvement. But uh, this is uh, really my selection uh, of um, uh, issues. Um, <clears throat> sorry, let me. And this is what I'm going to talk about. Uh, I just want to say something briefly about design issues and, and criteria uh, and design procedures. I'll say something also briefly about ground characterization, which I believe is uh, a critical part of. Uh, any aspect of geotechnical engineering. I'll say something uh, about the design tools we have available to us. And then I want to uh, discuss eight uh, inadequacies as I see them of common design procedures. Uh, and these are listed here, ignoring uh, foundation interaction effects, ignoring the beneficial effects of the raft or mat, assuming that the raft or pile cap or mat is rigid, oversimplifying the geotechnical profile, ignoring the beneficial effects of basement walls, ignoring the effects of ground movements that uh, may occur due to external sources, ignoring kinematic effects in seismic design, and finally, assuming uh, that piles behave as elastic uh, columns. In terms of the uh, foundation issues, uh, these, I believe, are the key ones. Obviously, ultimate capacity and overall stability are paramount and, and must be satisfied. And in certainly with the certain structures, offshore structures and tall buildings, we also need to consider the possible effects of cyclic loading due to wind or seismic action. Settlement and differential settlement and tilt are critical issues. Uh, and then uh, we also need to uh, look at the effects of external ground movements. Coming back again to wind and possibly seismic issues, we need to understand the dynamic behavior of our foundation because that will in turn affect the structure and the structural response uh, to that wind or seismic action. We need to consider the effects of earthquake, how the foundation responds to earthquakes and the uh, susceptibility of the ground to liquefaction. And then of course, uh, these are all geotechnical issues, but we must also, of course, ensure uh, adequate structural strength of the foundation elements. And we must also ensure the durability uh, of the materials that we use in the foundation. In terms of the design analyses that we do, these more or less mirror the issues that uh, we have discussed uh, just now. Uh, we need to look at the ultimate limit state, which means we need to consider the overall stability uh, and the geotechnical and the structural capacity of the foundation system. And with respect to cyclic loading, what we try and do here is to limit the cyclic load uh, on any pile uh, to no more than about 50% of its shaft friction capacity so that we don't have a potential to degrade the frictional capacity due to cyclic loading. With serviceability, we need to establish uh, limits uh, on the settlement and the angular rotation of the foundation. And this we generally do uh, in conjunction with the structural engineers. And then with respect to dynamic loading, we need to be able to estimate the natural frequency of the foundation system uh, and the damping, uh, because these, as we said, uh, will influence the structural response and the loads that uh, the wind applies to the structure itself. Uh, 
And then with respect to earthquake loading, we need to consider two sources of um, loading, one due to inertial effects, that's the structural loading, and secondly, what we call kinematic loading, which is the fact that the ground moves during an earthquake and that itself uh, will cause uh, the uh, foundations to be impacted. <clears throat> In our design practice, we usually have a three-stage process. We have a preliminary stage, uh, which is uh, the basis for uh, developing the design concept. So we try and uh, home in on the number of piles and, and the type of piles we use. Uh, we then have a detail stage uh, where we develop and optimize the design and where we interact usually with the structural engineers, particularly if we're dealing with tall uh, buildings. And the final stage uh, where we um, uh, finalize all our parameters and our analysis, and we do a check with alternative analyses. And also, and very importantly, uh, with major projects, we uh, go through a peer review process just to make sure that everything uh, that needs to be covered is covered and covered adequately. As I mentioned uh, at the start, ground characterization is an absolutely critical part of the design process. Ideally, we need to be able to assess the geological history uh, of the site. Uh, and we need then, of course, to investigate uh, the subsurface conditions, which normally we do by a variety of means. Uh, obviously, boreholes is the, uh, is the classic method. But increasingly, we're now using geophysical testing, uh, downhole or crosshole uh, uh, seismic testing, for example. And uh, we are, um, of course, using in situ testing increasingly. Uh, SPT, which I know is uh, your favored method in Brazil, but also cone penetration testing, uh, uh, pressure meter testing, very popular in, in Europe, and dial atometer testing, which is also reasonably widely used in a number of countries. And then in addition to that, uh, with major projects, we almost always will do some form of load testing of the piles uh, under anticipated loading conditions, vertical and axial and possibly cyclic loading to check the performance uh, of the foundation and see that it is in accordance with our expectations. And in addition, uh, we of course always do some form of laboratory testing to try and characterize the, the ground in detail. Uh, we use conventional tests, uh, strength consolidation, grading and classification tests. And then uh, on certain occasions, we may use specialized tests, uh, uh, the so-called CNS or constant normal stiffness direct shear test, uh, stress path triaxials, and also resonant column tests for getting uh, dynamic stiffness and damping values. In our design process, there are a number of parameters that we have to assess for our ground conditions. The ultimate shaft friction and the ultimate end bearing are of course critical for the ultimate limit state. And then for serviceability, we need to be able to estimate the soil stiffness or modulus for vertical loading. And we need to understand that the values that we have for long-term uh, loading, which is normally dead plus live loading, uh, can be different and uh, smaller than the values for short-term uh, loading, such as wind and seismic loading. We also need to be able to estimate the ultimate lateral pressure between uh, the deep foundation and the soil and the soil stiffness and modulus for lateral loading because uh, soil uh, being uh, dependent on the strain levels for its uh, stiffness response, generally the strains in lateral loading tend to be larger uh, than for axial loading. And so the soil stiffness in lateral loading can often be um, 30 to 40% less than the values for vertical loading. And finally, uh, for our dynamic assessments, we need dynamic soil stiffness and damping. So there's quite a lot of decisions to be made uh, in doing a deep foundation design. The design tools we have, um, in concept design, we've found it uh, quite effective to use fairly simple spreadsheet or MathCAD analyses or design charts if they're available. Uh, at this stage, uh, obviously the engineer uh, must use 
judgment to adequately characterize the real problem to a simplified form uh, that uh, can be handled by these simplified methods. But certainly uh, this is a necessary precursor to doing a more detailed design. Now, of course, with the detailed design, that usually requires some form of software uh, because uh, we can't cover all the aspects with simplified methods. And when we look at uh, the uh, detailed methods, uh, the computer methods that uh, we may require, uh, there are a number of desirable characteristics uh, that uh, we should uh, hope that our uh, uh, software will have. We need to be able to handle pile groups that are subjected to vertical loads and moments in, in both uh, horizontal loads in both uh, directions uh, we, and torsion as well. We need to be able to handle realistic soil profiles, not just a, a uniform soil. We need to be able to cope with nonlinear soil pile behavior. And in many cases, uh, we can have different pile types, uh, sizes, diameters within a group. <clears throat> because there's no compulsion on us to have all piles in a group being the same. Ideally, we should be able to incorporate the flexibility of the raft or the cap. And ideally, and this is generally done through our structural colleagues, we need to incorporate into our final analyses the stiffness of the superstructure itself. Some of the programs that uh, are or have been commercially available, I've listed here. The first three are basically pile group analysis programs. There's an old program that I developed uh, now uh, almost 40 years ago called DefPig, and I'll refer to a, a development of uh, that program called CLAP, uh, which I've done subsequently, but isn't commercially available. Uh, then there's uh, Professor Randolph's program Piglet, uh, which is a fairly widely used, I think, and a very uh, useful program, uh, despite its limitations. And then uh, out of the UK is a program called Repute, which is uh, marketed by Geocentrics. Then the, the next three programs I have listed, Plaxus, Abacus, and FLAC, both 2D and 3D versions. These are all finite difference or finite elements in the case of FLAC, uh, sorry, finite uh, element, uh, uh, Plaxus and Abacus, and finite difference uh, FLAC analyses. And these, of course, are very powerful and increasingly used uh, in uh, uh, practice. I just uh, thought it would be uh, interesting to compare some of these programs and just uh, get an idea uh, of, of how they compare. So uh, a little while ago with uh, one of my colleagues, uh, Stefano Pirello, uh, we did a comparison of the programs CLAP, which is a deaf pig derivative, Piglet, Repute, and Plaxus 3D, and we applied it to the Inchon Tower, which uh, we were involved in uh, the foundation design, and which uh, we finished up with 172 board piles, two and a half meters in diameter. <clears throat> and what we did was we compared, we, we had a, uh, the same um, uh, geotechnical model for all of these uh, programs, and we compared maximum settlement, horizontal movement, maximum axial load and maximum moment in one of the lateral directions uh, for a particular set of loadings. <clears throat> and I won't try and go too deeply into the comparisons here, but the important uh, conclusion from this exercise was that all of these four methods give you reasonably similar results. And that's good because the basis of each of these methods is, is rather different. So I think that would suggest uh, that the method of analysis uh, probably isn't as critical as the way in which we estimate the, uh, the uh, uh, geotechnical parameters. So let me now go on to the main part of my lecture, which is uh, trying to examine some of what I consider to be inadequacies of common design procedures. The first of these, I've, I've listed these before, but uh, let me go through them again. Ignoring foundation interaction effects, ignoring the beneficial effects of the raft, assuming the raft or pile cap or mat is rigid, oversimplifying the geotechnical profile, ignoring the beneficial effects of basement walls, ignoring the effects of ground movements, ignoring kinematic effects in seismic design and assuming elastic behavior of the piles. So let's, uh, have a look firstly at 
uh, what happens if we ignore foundation interaction effects. And in general, what uh, we've come to recognize is that we, if we have a, a pile draft foundation or a pile foundation, which almost inevitably will have some sort of uh, mat uh, or raft uh, connecting the piles, there are four uh, sorts of interactions. There's the interaction between uh, one pile and all the other piles within the group. There's interaction between the raft and the piles. There's the interaction between the piles and the raft because the loaded piles will affect the raft. And uh, there is, of course, interaction uh, from various parts of the raft themselves. And unfortunately, in the past, certainly, some of these uh, interactions have been ignored, particularly when uh, people have used structural programs for foundation design. They've ignored uh, at least some of these interactions. So let's have a look at uh, uh, some of the consequences of ignoring interactions. And we're doing this in relation to uh, the uh, convention tower uh, in Doha, which was 551 meters tall. And uh, we had a, a role in this design. Uh, it involved the 525 uh, board piles uh, with the diameters between one and 1 1.5 meters and four different lengths. And the raft itself was four meters thick with local thickening in certain areas. Now I've run for this case, three different analyses. Uh, uh, what I call Q1, which is a normal analysis where all interactions are included. Then analysis Q2 is an analysis that might be run uh, with uh, a structural program, ignoring pile-pile interactions, but looking at the other interactions. And then Q3 is ignoring all interactions other than the fact that one part of the raft uh, interacts with another part. And the outcome of this uh, we see in this next diagram. On the top left, you'll see the maximum settlement uh, for the three analyses. And if we do the full analysis, uh, which is the um, most correct analysis, we get a maximum settlement of the order of 80 millimeters. If we ignore all but the mat interactions, we get about a quarter of that uh, settlement, which is only 20 millimeters. So you can see that um, including the interactions in this case, because we have many piles, 525 piles, uh, you will seriously underestimate the settlement of the foundation system. And similarly, if you ignore the interactions, you will, uh, as you go from Q1 to Q2 to Q3, uh, uh, ignoring more and more interactions, uh, you will underestimate the rotations. There isn't a huge difference in the raft moments, interestingly, um, in that uh, if you ignore the interactions, you still get bending moments that are of similar magnitude. If you ignore the interactions, um, uh, then you will get axial uh, pile loads, which are larger than the correct analysis. And so the outcome of this little exercise is that um, if we ignore interaction effects, we clearly get smaller predicted uh, settlements and rotations, although the effect on the axial loads and moments is less severe. So in terms of how we apply this to practice, we really shouldn't use single pile load test data without considering these interactions for the complete foundation system. And we need to use design methods that take interactions into account. And if we're dealing with our structural colleagues and we generally provide them with foundation stiffness values for all the piles within the group, those foundation stiffness values that we give them should take into account interactions. <clears throat> the second uh, issue I want to discuss is if we ignore the presence of the raft, if we say that all the load is going to be carried by the piles. And this is generally uh, what is done in many conservative designs. And in some codes, uh, they will actually not uh, permit you to use the raft, but it's there and it does contribute. So again, continuing on the case of the Doha Tower, I've got uh, various uh, uh, values here uh, allowing for the raft and ignoring the raft. And immediately you can see that the maximum settlement uh, 
uh, if we allow for the raft is, is just over 80 millimeters, 82 millimeters. If we ignore the raft in this particular case, then we have a settlement which is almost double. And of course would be deemed to be in, uh, it wouldn't satisfy the normal settlement criteria. So you would actually have to use more piles or deeper piles or larger piles uh, to satisfy the uh, settlement criteria. Also, if you ignore the raft, uh, you can see uh, that uh, we get much larger rotations. And the other really important issue is that if you ignore the raft, uh, then you get uh, calculated a maximum settlement uh, in your pile, uh, sorry, a maximum axial load in your piles of over 67 meganewtons, which is almost twice the maximum load if you allow for the raft. And in this particular case, we find that the raft takes almost a quarter of the load. And so this is why in this particular case, it's so important for uh, a reasonable design to allow for the presence of the raft. And so the outcomes of this uh, particular case, and I stress that this is not always, uh, the, the raft isn't always this significant, but in this particular case, certainly, uh, if you ignore the raft, the computed settlements and the rotations increase significantly. The maximum pile load is almost doubled, uh, although you only get a small increase in raft moment. So in practice, we really should recognize where appropriate the beneficial effects that the raft can have and use a design approach that can take that into account. <clears throat> Coming on next to uh, whether uh, a raft can be considered as rigid because the pile analysis programs, uh, Piglet, cl uh, Clap or Def Pig, and Repute all uh, generally assume that the raft is rigid. Now, to answer this question, when is a pile cap rigid, we can make use of the work of my late colleague, Dr. Peter Brown. And here uh, on this little diagram, we plot the relative thickness of the raft, the thickness divided by the breadth of the raft. And here is a Young's modulus of the soil. And if we have a combination of thickness of raft and Young's modulus that lies above this blue line, then the raft in fact is rigid. If we have a combination of thickness and modulus that lies below this red dash line, then the raft is effectively flexible. And uh, if we have somewhere in between, then it's an intermediate case. So let's have a look at what we would need uh, for a raft to be truly rigid. And in a very soft soil where we might have a modulus, let's say of, of just a few megapascals, to have a rigid raft, you would need a thickness on breadth of 0.25. So the thickness would need to be a quarter of the breadth, which is significant. If it's a very stiff soil, then your thickness would need to be the same uh, as the breadth of the uh, foundation system, which is ridiculous. And if we take a typical tall building situation where the raft thickness might be three meters and the footprint might be 50 meters, the thickness on breadth would be 0.06. And you find that that in general uh, means that the raft is actually flexible. And this is indeed what we find with tall buildings, even though the raft may be uh, quite thick uh, in absolute terms, in relative terms, because of the size uh, of the footing, uh, it can be relatively flexible. So what's the uh, outcome of that? Well, coming on now as an example to the uh, 600 meter uh, inch on tower again, which we considered uh, earlier, the 172 uh, piles, 2.5 meters in diameter, uh, 50 meters long, and a raft quite thick, 5.5 meters. And aside, this is quite a large foundation, so it's 88 meters by 77 and a half meters. Now, here we have um, various characteristics, and I won't go through all of these, pile load, stiffness, and raft settlement for the various piles in the group. But let me just highlight a couple of things, particularly with respect to the pile load distribution. In the center pile, if we assume a rigid raft, then 
the max of the pile load in the central piles is about 24 meganewtons. But if we take account of the flexibility of the raft, then that load goes to 49. So it's virtually doubled. In the corner piles, the rigid raft would have a load of 85 meganewtons, which is a very large load. This is eight and a half thousand tons. But if we allow for flexibility of the raft, then uh, it's now virtually halved to 43 meganewtons. The pile stiffnesses also are changed that the center pile takes more load and is uh, stiffer and the outer piles uh, take a little bit less load and so are less stiff. And of course we pay a price because uh, if the raft is flexible, then the maximum settlement will tend to increase. So the outcome of this is that um, the rigid raft assumption causes a concentration of axial loads near the outer piles, which means that uh, if uh, you had to design for those large loads, you'd need bigger piles and more reinforcement. So it would be a less uh, economical design. The maximum settlement uh, in a rigid raft is reduced. So that is actually not, con uh, that's not conservative. Uh, and the differential settlement um, uh, can be less if you assume the raft is rigid. So in terms of practice, the rigid raft assumption, if you've got small pile groups or small pile caps, that may be fine. If you've got a bridge foundation with uh, six or eight piles and they're fairly closely spaced, that will be fine. But if you've got a large pile draft supporting a big building, then the rigid raft assumption is generally not at all good. You need to check on the ratio of raft thickness to, to, to raft size. Is it within the rigid range? And if not, <clears throat> ideally, you need to use an analysis that accounts for raft flexibility. And then uh, you need to incorporate those appropriate springs uh, taking account of raft flexibility into the structural analysis. I now want to come to the next and, and quite critical issue. What happens if we oversimplify the geotechnical profile? Why do we oversimplify the geotechnical profile? Well, it can happen if we do inadequate ground investigation, which is always a bit of a problem with geotechnical uh, projects because the client generally wants to spend as little as possible on the ground investigation. One of the other possibilities is that we use uh, a knowingly or unknowingly a simplified analysis and design tools that assume constant conditions with depth. And also we may give inadequate attention to the potential variability of ground stiffness with depth. Uh, and we don't necessarily uh, uh, take account of the importance of the fact that as our strain level decreases, as we go away from the foundation, the stiffness of the ground effectively increases. So let me <coughs> run through, <coughs> excuse me, two examples uh, of uh, where we went wrong. And unfortunately, this first one is one of mine. Uh, it's to do with the Emirates Towers, uh, uh, which uh, are in Dubai. Uh, the office tower was 355 metres, the hotel tower 305. At the time uh, we did this about 20 years ago, uh, we designed the foundations. Uh, the office tower was the ninth tallest building in the world and the hotel tower was the 17th. Now, of course, they are not even in the top 50. Uh, the office tower <clears throat> had 102 piles, the hotel tower 92 piles, the diameters of 1.2 and 1.5. The pile lengths were 40 to 45 metres and the raft was 1.5 metres thick. This is the geotechnical profile and I won't try and go through this in detail, but it consisted of a series of layers of cemented uh, uh, calcareous sand uh, of various types. And basically the piles were founded in what is called a calci siltite, which is a soft uh, carbonate rock with typically an unconfined compressive strength of about two megapascals. So it was really quite a soft rock. Uh, we did initial load tests. And at the time, these were quite large load capacity tests. So this is a 3000 ton test uh, done with uh, 12 anchors. And uh, I was involved in this uh, in Dubai in the late 1990s. And I did a class A prediction, uh, which means that I actually predicted the load settlement behavior of this 
uh, test file or the test files uh, prior to their uh, being uh, undertaken. And uh, here is the comparison. This is vertical load and this is settlement. The dashed line is my prediction and the uh, uh, other lines are the actual measurements. So you see that I was a bit conservative in my prediction of the capacity and uh, to a lesser extent, uh, a little bit conservative in the estimation of the stiffness, the vertical stiffness or the settlement uh, of the pile, but not, that's not too bad a class A prediction. We also did lateral uh, load predictions. We jacked two piles against each other, one a larger diameter pile than the other. And we made predictions uh, of lateral load versus displacement. And again, the predictions were actually pretty good. And uh, so um, we anticipated that uh, when we did the settlement prediction for the overall foundation system, we would get quite reasonable results. So the a pile foundation was uh, a pile draft. Uh, we used conventional analyses for the capacity of the raft and the piles. And we used uh, uh, an in-house program uh, called GARP for the pile draft analysis in which the raft was represented at that time by finite differences and the piles were represented by interacting nonlinear springs. And we used the def peak analysis <coughs> to look at interaction factors between the piles. And we used the same parameters as for single piles. Now, unfortunately, when, uh, uh, as they started construction, they were measuring the settlements uh, of both the hotel and the office tower with time as the load was coming on. And unfortunately, our prediction is shown here in the full line. And what they measured is shown uh, by the circles and the triangles. So the measured settlements were about a quarter of what we had predicted. And this was very embarrassing. It's not as embarrassing as, as uh, <laughs> predicting uh, much smaller settlements than uh, were experienced, but it's still embarrassing. And so we tried to understand why we didn't predict so, uh, well, why we predicted so poorly the settlement of the building when we had uh, predicted the test pile behavior not too badly. And what happened here was that we made allowances for the fact uh, uh, that we recognize that the soil between the piles is stiffer, that we've also got piles in between the piles that are interacting. And below the pile tips, as we go further and further down, uh, the soil gets stiffer. And so it doesn't have a uniform stiffness right the way down to the bottom of the soil profile. And what happened there was that when we made those assumptions, the interaction factors decreased significantly uh, between the piles from this dark line to this dashed line here. So that the assumptions that we made about the profile and the stiffness variations had a major effect on the computed interactions. So when we looked at the consequences of that with respect to our settlement predictions, here is the settlement. Our original prediction for the hotel tower was about 138 millimeters, but the most um, reasonable prediction uh, that we made uh, gave a maximum settlement of the order of 40 millimeters. This is for the final building, not uh, the during uh, con uh, construction case. And so you see that uh, the assumptions that you make uh, there with respect to interactions uh, can be very, very significant. So the outcomes of that were, were that we uh, had an inadequate ground model. We assumed uniform stiffness below the pile tips for uh, a large depth. Uh, and it also pointed out uh, the potential problems of applying interaction factors to large pile groups without taking account of intervening piles and stiffer soil between the piles. And of course, the big uh, lesson here is that success in predicting test pile behavior doesn't guarantee success for overall foundation behavior. <clears throat> now, my second example uh, illustrates this point once again. This is not, uh, fortunately, not one that I was involved with. It's actually one that is in the literature uh, from over 50 years ago, but still a very interesting case published by Golder and Osler in the Canadian Geotechnical Journal. And it involved a 32 pile group supporting a furnace uh, foundation. The piles were founded in dense sand 
And if you look carefully at the profile here, they were founded in this dense sand layer. But below that was a deep layer of leader clay, which is one of these uh, classic uh, Canadian clays. Now, they did a pile load test, a single pile load test. Uh, the pile found it in the dense sand, and that showed a settlement of one millimeter at the working load. And so the designer said, good. Uh, this means that the overall group settlement, allowing for group effects, will be somewhere between three and six millimeters. Unfortunately, uh, what they found was very different. Now, this shows the settlement at various times after construction. And uh, at the latest date, um, the maximum settlement, instead of being three to six millimeters, was about 73 millimeters. And what had happened here was that uh, because the foundation, of course, was much more extensive in the classic way, it influenced the underlying leader clay uh, to an extent which the single pile did not, because the single pile influenced only a volume of soil within the dense sand. <clears throat> and so what that demonstrated again very clearly <clears throat> was that you need to carry out proper ground investigation to or beneath uh, beyond the depth of influence. You need to consider foundation interactions. Um, and um, again, uh, you, you must uh, bear in mind that if you have compressible underlying layers, uh, these can be very influential. Also, when you're using uh, interaction factors, uh, you need to use, uh, calculate these for the actual profile and allow for the fact that the soil is getting stiffer with depth and that piles will only interact to a certain distance, uh, which is less than uh, theoretical distance in a uniform soil. And again, uh, the lesson that uh, avoid relying on single pile load test data, which is valuable, but you must also appreciate the ground conditions. The next issue I want to cover fairly briefly uh, is uh, what happens uh, with basement walls, particularly with high rise buildings. Almost inevitably these days, we have a basement which provides for underground space and parking. And so we have diaphragm walls typically or piled walls, uh, which uh, uh, connect the piles which are, uh, and, the, and the raft. And so the question is, uh, do we get a benefit from uh, these uh, uh, basement walls. Now, my colleague, Dr. Helen Chow and I did a simple exercise looking at a, a 16 pile group under fairly idealized conditions. And uh, we did a uh, three dimensional analysis to look at the improvement firstly in capacity, uh, both vertical and lateral as the basement wall depth increased. And this on the vertical axis may be difficult for you to see is a percentage increase in uh, capacity. The blue is horizontal capacity. The green is vertical load capacity. And on the horizontal axis is the depth of the basement wall. So you can see that uh, particularly for the horizontal resistance, the basement wall provides you with a substantial increase in lateral capacity. And in this particular case, because the wall uh, depth is fairly large in relation to the size of the raft, it does give you also quite a significant increase in vertical capacity. It also gives you a uh, significant reduction uh, in the response or an increase in the stiffness uh, of the foundation. Again, uh, uh, this is the percentage reduction in response. This is the depth of the wall. This red shows you that um, uh, with a 10 meter deep wall, you get a 20% reduction in settlement, uh, but you get something like a 37, 38% reduction in lateral deflection because the wall is providing you with extra uh, lateral stiffness. So that is not insignificant. Uh, that can sometimes uh, also have a benefit of reducing the required reinforcement in your piles because the piles take less load. One thing I'll mention just briefly <clears throat> is that uh, we found that it is possible uh, if you're using a pile analysis program to represent the walls by a series of equivalent piles around the perimeter uh, of the raft. Uh, 
And what that does is it tends to uh, just modify the axial load distribution to a fairly minor extent. So <clears throat> you can and should uh, in, uh, allow for walls. They are beneficial. Uh, include them if you're doing a 3D finite element analysis and what I call a category three analysis, you can certainly include those. You can model the walls as equivalent piles. Uh, that's a simplified approach, but it still gets you in the right direction. Of course, then you can use a program such as Repute or even Piglet uh, to represent the wall. And then you can add, this is something I've been working on as a simple approach, adding a proportion of the axial and lateral wall stiffness to the pile group stiffness, which is uh, what you would do perhaps in a, a preliminary analysis. I want to now go on to talk uh, uh, about the effects of ground movements and how they uh, influence our pile foundation. There are many ways in which the ground can uh, move in response to some external stimulus. We know the case of negative friction where the soil consolidates and so drags down the pile. We can also have expansive soil which swells and so provides tension in the piles. We have a very common urban situation where you have tunneling operations near existing piles. Uh, you can have effects where you install piles next to existing piles. We have slope instability, which can cause ground movements. You can have uh, embankment construction uh, near a bridge so that uh, you influence existing piles. Again, a common urban situation where you have excavations adjacent to an existing uh, a foundation. And even if you construct a tall building, a heavy building next to existing piles, these can move the ground and that can influence the existing piles. <clears throat> I'm just going to look at this case. Um, um, uh, and before I do that, just to summarize that the vertical movements that arise out of whatever uh, agency will cause additional settlements and axial forces in the piles. The lateral movements can cause additional shears and bending moments. And those forces and moments can compromise both serviceability and ultimate strength, both geotechnical uh, and structural strength of the piles. Just as an illustrative example, uh, I've just taken this rather simple case uh, of a pile adjacent to a tunnel that's being bored. Uh, the tunnel is uh, 12 metres uh, from the pilot, the centre line of the tunnel, 12 metres away. We're assuming a 1% volume loss. And uh, what we find is that if we do calculations of the horizontal movements at the location of the pile, we find that um, they, uh, uh, the, the tunnel construction will cause a movement of the order of seven millimeters, which isn't all that much, but then the pile is still 12 meters away from the tunnel center line, uh, which is quite a distance. Now, what does that mean in terms of the pile behavior? This is uh, the left-hand diagram, the bending moment versus depth. The blue line is if we have no tunnel, the brown line is with the tunnel. And what you'll see is that the main effect is that we get a big increase in bending moment down near the center line of the tunnel where we get uh, significant lateral deflections. And if, as in many cases, we don't have reinforcement that goes all of the way down the piles, then we could actually finish up with piles cracking uh, down at this depth. We may never see those cracks, of course, <clears throat> but they can, in the long term, compromise the durability of the piles. In this particular case, we find that our settlement at the surface is actually virtually doubled uh, because of the vertical movements that are caused by that tunnel construction. And the axial forces within the piles are also increased because the tunnel construction is effectively causing down drag on the pile. So in terms, uh, th there's much more I could say about ground movements. Uh, there, there's several lectures that, that could be talked about here. But uh, in general, uh, we need to recognize or anticipate situations where external ground movements can occur. For example, with a, a very tall building that I've been involved with in, 
Kuala Lumpur, 180, 118 storey building, uh, there is planned a tunnel, uh, which is just a few meters away from the foundations. So we've had to make allowance in our design for the presence of that tunnel, even though it's not yet there. So we need to be able to anticipate future uh, construction activities. We need to take account of movements in design analyses. And really the uh, method of analysis that you use is less significant than recognizing the problem. And there are available now a number of simple chart solutions that you can use for preliminary assessments to try and uh, indicate to you whether those effects of ground movements are significant or not. <clears throat> now to the second last issue I want to discuss and that's kinematic seismic effects. As I mentioned uh, at the beginning, uh, if you have an earthquake uh, at, uh, at your uh, site, um, there are two types of uh, loading that are induced in the foundation. The first are inertial loads, which arise from the structure which responds to the shaking, and that produces essentially a dominant lateral force. And uh, in many codes of practice, uh, these certainly are recognized and are specified and you have to take those into account in design. And generally, these are forces that are provided to us uh, by our structural colleagues as uh, one of a number of design forces. The less obvious loadings due to seismic shaking are the kinematic loads. And these arise from ground movements that are caused by the seismic actions. The ground moves differentially, of course, uh, with depth and with time, and that uh, causes the pile to move. And of course, the pile can't move in the same way as the soil because it's stiffer. And so what happens uh, is that you get additional shears and bending moments caused in the piles. And these are very often, or have been certainly in the past, not recognized, often overlooked in design. <clears throat> so here's a semi-hypothetical case. Uh, it actually, the ground conditions are similar to those uh, in the city of Newcastle, 100 miles uh, north of Sydney. We have a soft clay layer overlying a, a stiff layer with shale below. And we've got uh, a, a small diameter pile, 0.75 metre pile, about 24 metres long. And I'm just looking now at the horizontal re, uh, bending moments uh, due to horizontal load uh, and their variation with depth down the vertical axis. And there are three lines here. The first of these, if you can see my cursor, is the green dashed line. And this is the bending moment that you would get from the inertial loads uh, of 0.2 meganewtons that are applied to the top of the pile. This is the bending moment that you would normally calculate uh, just from the uh, structural load provided to you by the structural designer. The blue line is the bending moment uh, that is due to the kinematic effects. This is because the pile uh, is now subject to the ground movements. And so uh, we're assuming that the head of the pile uh, is actually fixed against rotation. So it's within a pile cap. And uh, you'll see that it's very different now because at uh, virtually at this intersection between the soft and stiff clay, we get a very marked increase in bending moment. <clears throat> and if we consider both inertial and kinematic effects, then the pile head moment is substantially increased. And the other important effect is that the bending moment down at this junction between the soft and stiff clay is dramatically increased. So what the lessons are here is that the maximum bending moment can be seriously underestimated if kinematic effects are ignored. Under inertial effects, the moment becomes neg negligible in this case at about seven meters depth. But if you include kinematic effects, then the maximum moment occurs at strata boundaries. And if you don't reinforce the piles to the full length, then cracking is very likely and you can have long-term durability issues. So my message here is that ideally, if you're in a seismic area, it's prudent to allow for 
reinforcement to go right the way down and to look very carefully at uh, junctions between uh, soft and stiffer layers. And that is in particular, uh, if you have uh, a junction between a liquefied and a non-liquefied layer. So in terms of improving practice, we need to recognize the importance of kinematic effects. There are a number of simple methods that have been published that allow you to get an initial estimate of the bending moments due to kinematic ground movements. And uh, you can also make allowance for potential liquefaction effects. And if you find that they may be important, then of course you can then go ahead and use uh, pseudostatic or full dynamic methods. And uh, these are increasingly becoming available. <clears throat> the final issue I want to uh, discuss very briefly is our normal assumption that the pile behaves as an elastic material itself. In reality, particularly if you've got concrete piles, they behave non-linearly. And here is uh, a typical example uh, of a pile that's loaded laterally, bending moment versus curvature. Uh, and uh, this is um, uh, the real behavior which you can model uh, roughly by a, an elastic uh, plastic type of behavior. But certainly uh, you, you start off with linear behavior, but as the level of loading increases, the pile itself becomes nonlinear. Now, these are results from uh, uh, investigators in the United States, but they show the importance of considering uh, nonlinearity of the pile when your load level is fairly high. So in the left-hand diagram, we have lateral load versus pile head deflection. This is our calculation uh, if we assume that the pile behaves linearly, <clears throat> and this is what was observed as lateral load behavior. So you see up to a load in this particular case of two and a half kips to two and a half thousand pounds or about a ton, uh, we have reasonable agreement, but at higher loads, because the pile starts behaving non-linearly, uh, we get increasing disparity between calculated and observed. <clears throat> if however, uh, we allow for non-linear behavior of the pile itself, uh, then in this right-hand diagram, you see that the observed behavior is uh, predicted uh, very well uh, by that nonlinear pile model. And then uh, this is an interesting diagram because it shows the lateral load versus deflection uh, and the calculated behaviors for four different constant values of pile stiffness, going from an initial stiffness to very much a cracked stiffness. So uh, the stiffness for one is larger than for two, which is larger than for three, which is larger than for four. And you see as the pile stiffness uh, assumed decreases, you get bigger and bigger deflections. Now this full line with the dots is the calculation if you allow for nonlinear pile behavior. So what you can see is that we start off with the initial stiffness of the concrete. And as we go uh, further and further, we tend towards the, uh, the fully cracked stiffness. So in practice then, uh, either, uh, let me go on to the next slide. Um, if you don't have the ability to uh, change the modulus of the pile, you need to uh, use your judgment to uh, estimate the modulus of the pile for the load level that you anticipate. And if uh, you, you don't have that ability, then you can do a transition uh, between various pile modulus values, starting off with a high value, transitioning to a low value. There are computer programs now that do incorporate nonlinear pile behavior, uh, such as uh, L-Pile and Group 8, which are marketed by NSOFT in the United States. And of course, now with the more general uh, programs that we have with Plexus and so on, you can incorporate uh, nonlinear pile behavior, I believe, uh, into the analysis. So let me then come to my conclusions. In this examination of some of the, what I consider to be the inadequacies of pile design, some of these inadequ inadequacies uh, 
can lead to unconservative designs. If we ignore foundation interactions, we tend to underestimate settlements. That's unconservative. If we oversimplify the ground profile and don't allow for soft layers, then we can underestimate settlements. If we ignore the effects of ground movements, then we can underestimate the uh, actions, the moments and forces in the piles and uh, the movements of the piles. If we ignore the kinematic effects of ground movements and seismic design, again, that's not conservative. And if we assume linear behavior of the pile material, then at high load levels, we may underestimate the lateral deflections. Some of these aspects, however, <clears throat> can lead to conservative designs. If you ignore the beneficial effects of a raft, uh, then you will generally have to have more piles to compensate. Uh, if you assume that the, the cap or raft is rigid, then you may have to <clears throat> have stiffer or larger or more piles near the edges of the raft. <clears throat> if you oversimplify the ground profile and assume that the stiffness and strength is constant with depth, you may overestimate the settlement, which is conservative. And if you ignore the basement walls, then again, you're being conservative. You're not taking account of a source of capacity and stiffness, which is in fact there. So really, <clears throat> my key message here is that the key element in foundation design is the recognition of the important issues. How you take those into account is often less important. And quite frequently, simple analyses and charts are available that can provide preliminary assessment of the likely importance of these factors. And we do now have available complex analyses uh, that uh, you can use if detailed analyses are appropriate. And of course, the good news is that different programs we find with, uh, diff uh, with the same input can give you similar results. And again, finally, my final message, the most critical design issue is ground characterization and parameter assessment. Obrigado, thank you. Thank you very much, Harry. It was uh, very interesting and broad uh, presentation covering many aspects of the foundation area. Uh, I have some very few questions. I think people get a little bit overwhelmed or maybe timid to make questions in Brazil, That's fine. especially when we have a, a very top high level uh, a speaker as yourself. But uh, mm -hmm. I will try to uh, get these questions in Portuguese and, and, and make it uh, with my uh, own translation, make it available to you. Fine. Okay, one of the questions goes in the line of uh, differences between our state of practice, most probably uh, the person was talking about uh, South America or Brazil, and yes. the state of art that you have uh, presented <clears throat> magnificently to us today <clears throat> with all these nice advanced uh, models softwares and and ways of doing the analysis and getting uh, uh, basic parameters for interpretation and for design mm. so uh, this person is concerned about the fact that brazil has started to build in at least in in the south area of brazil uh, very tall buildings Yes. with more than 200, 250 mm. meters. Yes. So uh, he's asking uh, your experience mm. in what do, you, what do you think we should do or if it's convenient to keep doing these designs as the way we usually do, only with SPT, mm. with limited budgets, and to be honest, Harry, with our uh, a uh, mentality, which is a kind of a mentality from our engineers as well, and from our community that we should save money in the foundation. We cannot ask for many things and it's prohibitive to ask for lab tests and et cetera, et cetera. Et cetera. Do you mm. think it's reasonable then, uh, summarizing the question, uh, to go for this high 
tall buildings in our region of the world, the way we continue doing our state of practice today in our country and, and in these countries like ours? Okay, look, that's a very good question, Renato. And let me try and answer it this way. I, I am aware that uh, your standard practice in Brazil uh, centers around the use of the SPT and that uh, there is a tendency to use simplified methods and they have been tried and tested uh, in the past, I guess, uh, through uh, buildings of a certain range. With your tall buildings now, where you're going 250, 300 meters tall, you're now outside the realms of your previous experience, largely. And what I would suggest is that it's fine to, as a preliminary analysis, the first stage is to use your usual methods to get an idea of what the requirements are. But I don't think that's enough in terms of uh, our responsibility as professional foundation designers uh, to stop there. I think we need to try and impress upon the clients that you have a building that uh, costs multi-millions of dollars and that its security uh, and effectiveness depends on the foundation, which costs a few million dollars, yes. But I mean, to try and save $100,000 on the ground investigation, uh, when you have uh, hundreds of millions of dollars of investment is a very poor uh, investment indeed. Uh, uh, and so I think at the very least, uh, what uh, should happen beyond that initial stage is that there should be a more detailed investigation and examination of the preliminary design, uh, perhaps using uh, pile load test data, using uh, something uh, well, I mean, if, if you only have SPT data, I've, I must admit, I've often used SPT because that's all you have. And of course, in Brazil, you have the great advantage that you've got decades of experience of correlations. So that's fine. But really, um, uh, you can get outside the realm of experience. Uh, and when you're dealing with tall buildings, your foundations may go down 50, 60 meters, and you may have experience only 20 or 30 meters. And so uh, you need a proper basis for extending your empirical uh, experience beyond the range that it already is. So I think there's still a place uh, for uh, doing that. And in fact, let me say, Renato, that um, when I started my experience in Dubai, and this is now 25 or more years ago, the state of practice there was very much as in Brazil, there were uh, certain design parameters, of course, they hadn't built buildings anywhere near uh, uh, the, the Emirates Towers buildings, which were the first really high rise buildings. We came along, we did pile tests, we did lab tests. We showed that in fact, instead of 100 kilopascal skin friction, we could use 300, uh, uh, 250, 300 kilopascals. So we saved a huge amount just by doing those tests on the foundation design. And that of course led on to uh, different levels uh, of um, uh, design uh, and now a standard process where obviously you do spend a lot of money uh, and you do have peer review and so on during uh, that design process. So I think that uh, should and I'm sure will happen in Brazil uh, because um, it just has to, you know, we can't keep uh, using methods, even though we love them and they're tested on uh, shorter buildings, we can't keep on using them increasingly for taller buildings. Okay. Very good, very good and very uh, comprehensive uh, uh, reply. Uh, we have another question from a colleague uh, who is uh, maybe actually standing uh, this question, which is how would be the best way to use pile-load data, in situ pile-load data with large-scale piles, what would be yes. the best way to do that, to use that in your daily design of average? I, I guess this is for yeah. average uh, buildings with average <clears throat> foundation works. Yes. Now, that's, that's a good question. Um, and I can tell you 
essentially what I do, Renato. Um, what we try and do, and if we're just talking about a normal vertical load uh, versus settlement uh, load test, what we try and do is from the tests, we try, if we've got no instrumentation at all, all we have is a load settlement behavior at the pile head. So what we try and do is to estimate the ultimate capacity of the pile, uh, firstly, uh, and sometimes you need to extrapolate it or uh, make a judgment on what the ultimate capacity will be. Then we try and fit our uh, actual load uh, settlement behavior to a theoretical behavior and we see what sort of average modulus is required to fit uh, the theoretical and actual behavior. And that gives us a first estimate of the modulus of the soil uh, along the shaft and a little bit below. Now, if we have instrumentation uh, along the pile, which many modern load tests now have, particularly now that we have fiber optics that enable uh, instrumentation much more efficiently and effectively, then we can get a detailed distribution of the skin friction with depth. And that's what's happened with a lot of the Dubai projects. We now have very nice uh, differentiation from layer to layer of ultimate skin frictions and also of local modulus and stiffness values. And there are ways of interpreting stiffness from local TZ curves, if you like, the uh, uh, displacement uh, versus uh, stress curves. Now, that's the first thing you do, but then you must have a look uh, then once you've done that, you must have a look at the overall profile. And this is why it's critical. And Tutsagi told us this way back, you know, 80 years ago, Tutsagi and Peck, do your investigations uh, to and beyond the depth of influence of the overall foundation. And those two cases that I've told you are startling examples of that. And if you have a soft layer, then look at the whole thing. And I, what I often do is I look at, uh, I just take the pile group as an equivalent peer and see what uh, settlement uh, of that peer is due to the underlying softer layers. And you can get a, just with simple calculations, you can get an idea of how significant the underlying layers are and you get a better idea of what the overall group settlement is. So this is why I say, I think pile testing is absolutely critical, certainly to major projects, because firstly, it gives you an idea of the ultimate capacity. And that is, of course, uh, a major issue in terms of uh, the ultimate limit state and capacity. But then you can also use it to uh, improve your estimate of serviceability, settlement, and perhaps lateral load. Okay, thank you. There's another question which I'm going to uh, <clears throat> translate from another colleague from our society, which yes. goes in the line, which is, I, I was going to ask you the, this question, but our colleague have already That's asked good. it. Uh, so it goes in the line of soil structure interaction, foundation mm -hmm. superstructure yes. interaction. Yes. So basically, uh, the the question is, what happens? I mean, uh, let me start with uh, uh, before asking the question, uh, making one uh, consideration. Our colleagues, structural engineers, they have already started designing uh, full buildings using soil structure interaction. And they include yes. the foundations, not in the best way, not with the best analysis, maybe with linear springs, whatever, and they, you have to get the K, H, or K, whatever, from the spring, and et cetera. Yes. So our colleague is asking, uh, how can you incorporate in pilot raft analysis, and I would uh, uh, extend that for mm. a normal uh, foundation analysis, <clears throat> the stiffness of the walls, the stiffness of uh, uh, the columns, and, and how can you do that in a nice manner? Not the way our structural colleagues are doing, using their programs and putting the soil with a simple springs, with linear hmm. springs, non-interacting springs whatsoever. Yes. Uh, uh, do you hmm. think this is an important issue and how can we implement that in our geotechnical foundation practice? Thank you. That's a, an excellent question. Let me tell you 
what I do, and, and this I, I hope will be an answer to the question. We try and work very closely with our structural colleagues, and they start off with a simplified assumption in their structural analysis of the foundation system. Often they will assume that it's rigid and they will come up with uh, loads, column loads, which they then give to us, okay? So that's the first step. We take those loads, we put those into a pile draft analysis and we, uh, and if we've got basement walls, we can model those as stiffer elements of the raft. Uh, okay, we've done this, uh, particularly lift cores and so on. Uh, we put in stiffer elements to try and model the cores. What we then do is uh, our program takes account of the various interactions. And so we finish up uh, getting settlements at each of the column locations or each, sorry, each of the pile locations. And we provide back uh, to our structural colleagues, the stiffness at that load level of each of the piles, taking account of the, uh, the raft modeling and the fact that uh, you may have stiffer bits here and there. They take those and these, of course, these uh, springs include interactions because they're, they're included through our analysis. They take our spring stiffnesses, they do another iteration of pile loads Okay, they put those spring stiffnesses into their structural model and they give us an, a second set of pile loads and we then take those and give them a second set of pile spring values. Generally two or three iterations and we get close enough. Okay, so it's actually an iterative process. Now in an ideal situation where there is no limit on money and you have no limit on the power of your program, you would do the whole structure and you would model every pile and every little bit. That has been done uh, on, uh, on the Dubai Creek Tower, which uh, if it's ever finished in Dubai, will actually be the tallest free stranding structure in the world. It's well over a kilometre tall, uh, but it's, it's suffering delays at the moment. But the designers that did that, and I was just a peer reviewer, uh, um, the designers that did that actually modeled the tower and it was a very complex structure and the foundation system, which consisted of barrettes um, uh, rather than piles. So that can be done, but that was a very, very uh, specific, uh, important and expensive structure, billions of dollars worth. Uh, and of course, you then pull out all the stops with that. But that's the process, Renato. It's a uh, what we call in English an iterative process. You start with an assumption, uh, you modify it according to our interpretation of the stiffnesses of the piles. They start again and, uh, and we go through until we get a converged solution. Okay. <clears throat> Now we have many questions here. So <laughs> many questions oh. appeared. I received another one through my WhatsApp. And uh, this one, I guess, is from one colleague from the geophysics area. Yes. And actually, yes. This, this, is a, this is a question which also I was thinking about. And uh, he, he just made this question, uh, uh, basically thinking about seismicity events. Well, we are, Brazil, we are in the center of the South American plate. So basically, mm. decelerations are very mm. low, with few yeah. exceptions, perhaps in the north, uh, northeast, uh, like Natal mm. City, with half uh, 0.05 G of acceleration, yeah. very low compared to uh, countries in the Pacific. Of But uh, ne nevertheless, we had some years ago, he mentions here, uh, a seismic event in Bolivia, which has yes. been felt by tall buildings, uh, buildings with more than 10 uh, floors in the right. central, central area of Brazil. So he yes. is asking, in your opinion, uh, we don't have this in our rule. We don't use, uh, it's not common to put seismic force or dynamic forces in viaducts mm -hmm. or, or, or uh, buildings or whatever in, in our uh, country. But he's asking if in your experience, if it would be worthwhile to start considering 
at least small seismic <laughs> events for very tall buildings or or very critical uh, exportation routes with uh, uh, via viaducts, uh, bridges, or whatever. Yes. Look again. That's a really good question, um, and I guess um, my experience is that in Australia we thought we like you in Brazil are in the middle of a plate, and so we didn't really think earthquakes were a major issue. But in 1989, uh, the city of Newcastle, that is 100 miles north of Sydney, suffered a it was a 5.7 I think magnitude earthquake. It killed 13 people, did billions of dollars worth of damage. And so that uh, area had been classified as an area zero, which means you don't have to consider earthquakes. Now, of course, it's a high earthquake risk zone. And there are other zones in Australia that have suffered major earthquakes. We've even had up to a 6.8 in the western part of the country. In the United States, in the eastern part of the country, they didn't think they had earthquakes there. And yet um, uh, some, uh, I think a century or two ago, they had a major earthquake. Uh, in Missouri. And so that's changed the whole thing. In Singapore, in Hong Kong, not recognized earthquake areas, but they've had shakes even in Dubai uh, about three or four years ago. They had a magnitude six and that shook the buildings there. So unfortunately, there is no place on the planet, as far as I can see, Renato, that is immune from earthquakes. And I think even though the risk may be very low, it may be worth at least examining, and this is the beauty of simplified methods, you can have a look at what if we had an earthquake that provided a 0.05 G excitation, what would that do, and so on. Now, it turns out that for tall buildings, uh, the seismic, certainly as far as the structure is concerned, the seismic issue is generally less important than the wind. So wind, uh, dominates over the seismic issues. Not so for low rise, of course, uh, but for high rise, certainly that's the case. But the kinematic effects uh, are still worth having a look at, uh, particularly if you've got, let's say, you've got a very soft clay layer and then you've got stiffer soil underneath. You need to look at what happens at that boundary. And there are fairly straightforward ways. And now if you look through the literature for kinematic bending in piles, you'll find dozens of papers. Um, starting off with a really good paper uh, by uh, Nicolau and Gazettis and others in Geotechnique in 2001. It's a paper that I use very frequently. So uh, yes, look, you need to have a look at this, even uh, if uh, it turns out to be not important, at least consider it because uh, you never know, okay? Okay, thank you. We have uh, time for just more two questions. I will ask uh, Professor Poulos to try to be brief on the answers. Okay. Uh, I apologize to our colleagues because many questions just appeared and many congratulations, con congratulations messages have been oh, sent in you. the chat. Very kind. And uh, I will ask our colleagues to send the congratulation messages and some further questions, which I don't have time to make directly to Professor Harry Poulos if uh, if it's possible, and uh, we will see how we can do that. Uh, but uh, only two very quick yes. questions. I apologize yes. because we don't have time for more questions. One colleague is asking about uh, your experience in other countries that eventually may eventually be using the SPTT with torque, which is picking up in Brazil when we yes. started to use in some... Uh, more uh, well-designed uh, foundation uh, sites. And do you think uh, that it would improve the geotechnical design and how is your experience with maybe other countries that are using this uh, in situ tool? I'm very well aware of the SPTT and its use in, in your country. I'm not sure, I, I think we have actually used it here in Australia once or twice. I don't know to what extent it's been adopted in other countries. Uh, my view is that it gives you extra information. And so anything that gives you extra information without uh, too much effort is worthwhile. And I, I know uh, Professor Decor, for example, is a strong proponent of the SPTT and he's uh, developed some really nice correlations. And anything we can do to uh, 
provide uh, added information, I think is worthwhile. So I would encourage it. It's just a question, you know, people, uh, it takes a long time for people to absorb certain messages. And I think the SPT team uh, message still uh, has to be uh, uh, promulgated. Okay, thank you. And the last question, sorry for all my colleagues who are still sending <laughs> questions here, but please, uh, we may yes. be, uh, be sending later on, we will find a way to, to have these questions okay. uh, reaching Professor Harry Polis. Uh From a colleague of our society who is talking about submerged foundations. And yes. uh, if you can talk a, a little bit about that and how you would access these submerged foundations for suction effects. Oh, uh, that's a that's a tricky that's a tricky question. The whole issue of of uh, submerged foundations and and suction foundations and so on is uh, uh, and has been for the last decade a hot topic in in offshore engineering. It's not something, to be honest, that I've really had experience with. Um, and all I can say is that. Um, in all of those foundations, uh, if one adheres to the basic principles of soil behavior, uh, and you look at um, uh, the various uh, aspects uh, uh, of soil behavior, the strength and serviceability, uh, then uh, it, it is possible, of course, to use uh, at least some of the onshore uh, techniques uh, for offshore. But I know uh, my friends uh, in Western Australia, for example, and, and certainly many people in the UK now uh, are very much concerned with that type of foundation, particularly in relation to uh, supporting wind turbines offshore, because this is, of course, all part of the green energy revolution. So I'm sorry I can't give you too much uh, more uh, information because it's not within my realm of direct experience. Well, <clears throat> thank you very much. It was a fantastic evening we had with you. <clears throat> I want to thank you again in the name of our society, in the name of our colleagues, in the name of my country, to kindly accepting to participate in our special celebration, 70 years of our society. So it's a special date. I hope, I honestly hope it doesn't take more extra 10 years for you to come back <laughs> to Brazil, perhaps in one of our future events after this pandemic, uh, yes. uh, you know, terrible uh, uh, season has gone. And I wish you all the best. I wish you to continue in contact and with our friendship, mm -hmm. personal and institutional and between uh, our universities as well. And I hope to meet you very soon, maybe. Mm -hmm one of these future e events. I know that uh, we will have, and it's good to tell to our colleagues here, an international conference in, in Australia, maybe next year, maybe it's going to be postponed, we don't know. And uh, hopefully if uh, I go or other colleagues from Brazil go, we will meet you there. Thank you, thank you very, very much, good. Professor Harry Polos. And please, you can finalize with some few words, and then I will move to the other platform and we will finish here. Very good. Well, thank you, Renato, for, for your very kind words and uh, congratulations to your society on its 70 year anniversary. Um, your society was founded 20 years uh, before ours because here we're celebrating our 50th anniversary of the Australian Geomechanics Society. But I think our societies uh, have much in common in terms of enthusiasm uh, and, uh, and contributions uh, to the world. And so it's been my distinct pleasure to be able to, to talk to you this evening. So thank you personally uh, for the invitation. Thank you to the society and thank you all uh, who have participated in this. Uh, it's been really a very, very uh, pleasant experience for me. So, Buen Norte. Thank you, thank you. Obrigado. I will Obrigado. close here and I will move to the other platform, streaming okay, platform. Good. Thank you. Very Bye. Good. Bye, Harry. Thank you.